Welcome. In this video, I am going to do some more problem solving uh, with some pretty important SQL components. First, we're going to do a group by with an aggregate and to see how we can use that to solve problems. So, the question would be, list the industry and the number of different companies in each industry. Put your answer in order of most stocks to least stocks. Well, we, we know we're going to have a uh, count because number of different companies lends itself to the aggregate count. So if you see number of, that almost always makes you want to think of count. Similarly, if you heard largest, you'd say maximum. If it was smallest, you'd look at minimum. If you'd look total, you'd think of uh, sum. And if you wanted average, you'd use average. So let's answer this query. And we'll bring it up here. So this is select industry, comma, count. And we're doing something new here. We're using a distinct. So let's look at this. I'm going to put this right at the top. But we are going to look at the industry and the ticker symbols for each industry. If I took out the distinct, it would give me a, a count of every row. So it would give me a terrifically different and wrong answer. So let me do both ways. I'm going to do the correct way first. And then I'm going to take out the distinct and show you why without it, it's wrong. So we're counting the number of, of ticker symbols or companies in each industry. Let's run this. And we see that in tech we have 22 stocks, in healthcare we have 17, in oil and gas we have 10, uh, retail we have 10, so we have a lot of stocks. We have 100 stocks and they they span some industries. It's dominated by tech. Now let's take out distinct and we'll see that we get a very large wrong answer. And so tech, we have 89,228. What that means is we have about that many rows where tech is in it. But we get the same company over and over and over. So distinct lets us see the number of unique ticker symbols for each industry. So we execute that, look at the answer. Um, this construct right here of select um, a, a non-aggregate and then count an aggregate, um, do the group by, uh, that is very common. It's a fundamental thing that we all have to learn. Notice at the end, we order by the number of stocks. That's my alias. So here's the num of stocks. And then I order by that same exact name, descending, because the question asked to show the, from most stocks to least stocks. Let's go to the next one. This next question uh, says, list the 10 most common closing prices along with the number of times each occurs. So let's say a really common closing price is $100 then that would appear as one of the 10 most common closing prices. It's a little bit tricky here because we're going to be looking for a um, uh, ticker symbol and then a very common. In fact, we're going to introduce the top function. So let's see how we answered that question. We're going to, to put up the closing price and then we're going to do a count star. Um, then we have, it's, it's from stock data. We're grouping by this closing price, and then we're ordering by the count star descending. Well, what this did was it gave me the top 10 uh, closing prices, and we, we formed this in groups, 
be, uh, based on the count or the count star. So we run this and we see that $6 comes up 244 times, $7 comes up 239 times, and so forth. So this is kind of a novel way to so solve this problem. We get the, the closing price, we use the top function, and in this case, because we have the count star, it's returning the one that occurs most frequently. That's kind of a fun problem, one that you don't often see solved like this, but you see the need for it a lot of times in industry. Let's move to the next problem. This was kind of a fun one. It's not a group by, but I really wanted to show using a function, and as much as anything, it's about problem solving. The question reads, how much older is Rasputin than Tommy Lee in seconds? Now, we had to make an estimate here of when Rasputin was born, because we don't really have a day, and we certainly don't have a time, um, so we know it's 1869. So we just chose January 1st, 1869. Um, we don't have a time of birth for Tommy Lee, but it was uh, October 3rd, 1962. So the, the default, when we put it in, is going to assume midnight for each. Well. The fun part of this problem is if we want to do it in seconds um, and we use a date diff function, it's going to be a stack overflow. So we don't use date diff. We use a, a, a lesser known uh, variation called date diff underscore big. And I kind of wanted to show both the function and how we might solve a problem um, uh, as well. So we're going to do date diff. Date diff takes three arguments. It says the, the first argument is what's the granularity of day or time? In this case we wanted to do seconds. We could have said uh, mm for months or yy for year. In fact we'll do that here in a moment. But because we did seconds we had to account for a much larger value being returned. Let's execute that, and we get 200, well, let's see, 2,958,508,000. Let me say that again, 2,958,508,800 seconds date differences or seconds differences between those two people in history. Now, if we just change this for a moment to why, why? We'd see that that's about 93 years. It's, it's uh, depending on where it crosses the month or the the year boundary here. And if I chose MM, that would say how many months difference between those two people. Um, you can also do quarters. So if you look up all the different types of time. Uh, granularity items in date diff, you, you can choose any one of those to do that. So we had fun with that. We have a couple of people from history, more modern, and then some, somebody from the 1800s. And we want to see time differences. We have a lot of options available to us. Let's go to our next question. Now, this is a query that we start to do non-obvious types of joins. The question reads, list every date that falls on a Friday from the calendar table regardless of whether there are matching rows from the stock data table. Well, when I say list every date, that makes me say a left join. Okay, let's just review for a second uh, common types of join in SQL. Um, the most common is an inner join or just a join. And then we could have a one-sided join. In this case, we're going to have a one-sided join. And you can have a left join. So you can have an inner join, a left join. You can have a right join, a full join. And the one that's not like the others at all is a cross join. Uh, it's good to see when to use each one and to be real good at it so that we have more power in problem solving. So we're going to do a join on the calendar table to the stock data table, the common attributes then are 
actual date to trade date. So let's see the answer here. We said we want all rows from the calendar table regardless of the fact that they have a match in the stock data table. So that necessitates what we call a left join. That means we get all rows from the left or the first table, and then in this case, matching rows to the table on the right. So all on the left matches on the right. And here we have an alias calendar is C. Uh, the alias for stock data is SD. We, we do the on here. The question also asked only those t uh, instances where the day of week was equal to a Friday. So let's run this. And if we go through, we see only Fridays show up and we have 89,157 rows. So we listed every row in the uh, calendar table and only matches to the stock data, but you'll notice that uh, we have just Fridays. Notice here in the far columns that where we have something for ticker symbol industry and trade date, there was a match. But down here where it just says null, that means there's no net matches. So we had everything from the one side um, and sometimes we had matches on the stock data si uh, side and sometimes we didn't. Okay. Nice. Let's go to our next question. This question um, is going to illustrate a full join. So the question reads, list the day of week and every date that falls on a weekend from the calendar table. So now we're going to have to do something in the WHERE clause to get a weekend. And all rows from the stock data table. So this is classic full join. We want everything from the calendar table, we want everything from the stock data table, and we want matches where those matches exist. So let's illustrate that query here. It's kind of fun to see this one. Uh, we didn't really say which attributes that we wanted to have displayed. But it would be natural that we see a date, a day of week. Um, the other thing that's interesting here is I have stock data as SD. And up here, I say SD.star. What that allows me to do is to say, I only want these two uh, attributes from calendar, the actual date and the day of week. But then I want all attributes from the stock data table. So an SD star allows me to say all attributes from the stock data table. Now because I said I wanted everything from calendar and matches to st uh, stock data, actually I said I wanted everything from calendar and everything from stock data and matches where appropriate. That's why I had to do a full join. And in the WHERE clause, I just say day type is weekend. And remember, day type is an attribute found in the calendar table. Let's run this. And notice here at the bottom, we have nulls again. That means we have some days, like in 1960, as it says over here, that uh, we did, had no trading. But then if we scroll to the top, um, find in some spots, we'll find some that do have matches, um, and so we had our full join there. And actually, you're going to never have trading on a weekend, if you think about it, because stocks don't trade on weekends. Okay, So that's an example of a full join. Okay, That's the end of this lesson. Hopefully we had fun with a left join and a full join and a, a big date difference. Um, and remember that those group buys and those aggregates are really important. Thank you.